Good morning uh, or good afternoon or maybe good evening depending on where we are in the world. Welcome to this webinar. We will, uh, my name is Marie Peterson, I'm the Marketing Director for KMO Software and uh, with me today I have uh, Dr. Frank Vespa who will be presenting. This webinar will be uh, recorded and we will share it after um, the session and um, we will do the questions at the end of the session. So um, I'm estimating that Frank will talk for about 40-45 minutes and we'll leave a good um, time in the end of this session to uh, put any questions forward. The questions we would like you to post, you can post them during the session itself in the chat box, in the questions box and we will pull them up afterwards. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Frank, who is our scientific officer at Camo Software, and he will talk about uh, assumption-free modeling and monitoring of batch processes today. Thank you, Marie, and uh, hello, everyone, and thanks for joining uh, this webinar. Uh, so my name is Frank Westad. I've been working for Camo for a number of years and uh, with all kinds of uh, different applications and uh, methods. And here are some slides about our approach for modeling uh, time-dependent processes. So let's look at the agenda. Just some background about the multivariate world. Uh, something about batch analysis. The challenges that one might um, Sort of experience uh, our approach and one example case and conclusion. So we know that batch processes are widely adopted in multiple industries um, and it's often uh, based on some recipe or how a process will change over time by adding something or by raising temperature or uh, uh, other sort of predefined um, actions uh, to move one process from one state to another, either in, in a chemical biological context or maybe also um, based on physical attributes like, uh, mm, for example, particle size distribution or, or other things. So in most cases, um, these processes are not adjusted automatically to accommodate changes in raw material or factors that might be controlled or uncontrolled and it's always important in process development to take into account all sort of possible future variations some can to some extent be controlled others not and also the models must be validated across uh, these uh, sources of error and it's very important to bring in all qualitative information in your data table so that you can validate across various sources of variation and find where, sort of, where do I have uh, my uh, challenges. And uh, we can, of course, um, monitor uh, any process of the continuous process with individual variables um, and uh, also we can use raw materials, we can use uh, uh, variables uh, then measured sort of in uh, different process steps um, and then we can uh, see if something sort of is out of bounds. So going back to sort of the background on the multivariate world, I know I'm preaching to the choir for this audience, um, but just to briefly look at sort of one important aspect is that if we use individual uh, control charts um, to look at uh, key variables or key process attributes or what term you use. Um, it might look like individually they are under control like with the upper con uh, lower control limits but like in, in this case if two variables are um, correlated we cannot spot uh, that something is out of bounds if you just look at individual limits because then these limits will sort of form um, a rectangle in the upper left. 
but the sweet spot in this case will be defined by the, the ellipse. The good thing is that although this is shown for only two variables, it can be extended to three and also to 103 if you use the multivariate method. So we don't lose sort of the, the confidence um, level uh, when we use multivariate methods as opposed to if you look at individual plots. And so in essence, all processes are multivariate until otherwise proven. And the concept of uh, PIT, this is analytical technology, has sort of been introduced, uh, must be almost 10 years back, uh, as a way to, um, to understand processes, uh, not only in the uh, production phase, but also uh, in, in large scale uh, pilot plants, where these methods also uh, can help uh, in, uh, together with the some experiments to come up with a, a stable um, sort of recipe or procedure. So we should use our process analyzers in a multivariate context. And also we know from the background of method calibration that to understand the process uh, qualitatively and also for predicting something, we don't need selectivity with our sensors. So it means that in the individual sensors, do not need to measure dusting on fish, as expressed by the German philosopher Kant. But together, individual sensors might tell us sort of the whole story about what's going on. So, batch process. We know that the modeling is important for the development and also understanding and, and also for the, the monitoring phase. So, for example, um, let's say I'm doing process development and I do some experimental plan based on uh, sort of some statistical methods uh, to estimate uh, sort of the effects of different uh, uh, design variables and also maybe their interactions. Uh, so I can analyze the batch data from, from these experiments where I deliberately sort of try to span my, um, my design space. And also, of course, are the batches similar? And how can I decide if they are? And if not, so why do I have, at the end, maybe not the optimal product quality after running uh, a batch process? And coming back to the importance of uh, validation and um, effect of uh, raw materials or season operator equipment, uh, how can we estimate sort of the impact of those uh, sources of uh, variation. So uh, we know that the monitoring is important, the quality control, event detection, something um, happened that was not expected, and also to continuously improve the processes by including maybe more batches and say, well, this is also information because I've seen uh, this effect of one variable now for three weeks time, so I believe also I will see it for the future, so I need to build that variation into my model. So traditionally, when we analyze one data table, it looks like this with observations and variables, and then we use methods like uh, visual component analysis, we can use um, uh, for example, um, cluster analysis uh, for spectral data, multivariate curve resolution, and if we are sort of lucky, we can estimate the pure signals in that system because that's always our goal. With the methods we use to, to find the pure signals and then uh, how much is there of, of these signals in individual cells. So then we can go to the, the batch uh, case, we add the time as a third dimension. Um, so we can uh, visualize it uh, like this with uh, the, the batch and the number of variables and the time. Um, but also this cube here to um, the left is a bit sort of idealized, but because we don't, we don't see here, like, is the length of the batches the same? So we cannot 
really say the world is easy now we can use the three way method to analyze this the data cube. To go into the details a bit more. So either we can use a direct three way method like uh, Parafac, the sort of PCA in, in three dimensions and actually also more dimensions. Um, and then we can sort of separate the effect of the variables and the time and that uh, can also work nicely but then there's still a challenge how to use that in in the monitoring phase although maybe some tricks can be used. So then another option is to unfold what is called time-wise and also over the years in literature the terms that are used for the unfolding may change, but now I'm going back to sort of the, one of the original papers now in this presentation. So time-wise means that we have a number of roads, which would be the batches, and for each point of time, we have the value for uh, every variable that is observed. So this is what we call sort of then um, the short fat matrix. Then we have the batch-wise. Um, unfolding where we say okay let's use the variables as columns and then we take all the time points for batch one and then we uh, will add then all the time points for batch two and, and so on and the number of time points might not be the same so not all uh, in the first case either so uh, and if then we have the final product quality uh, for individual batches, we can also use the time at unfolding and we can make like a regression model. So we have a number of variables that will be uh, time points uh, times variables. And we can see how that relates uh, to the final product quality. So in this instance, we sort of we see that. Um, the changes over time um, in the, in the loading space uh, for such a model, while the scores will be sort of just the individual batch. So the procedure will be to collect data for number of batches, and then for the explorative phase, uh, we look at um, um, the results typically from PCA, and we um, we look at uh, the variables, which ones are important, which are not to have any outliers uh, among the samples, can we take them out with a good gut feeling? And also, uh, although we say that this is sort of assumption free, our approach is so that one must carefully um, sort of consider which of the variables that they have um, are changing over time and which are kept constant like the control, um, maybe we set the temperature to 37 degrees and then it will vary between 36.5 and 37.4. So, uh, or the dosage uh, of uh, some substance, then that will sort of be added at specific points of time throughout uh, the batch. These are not the variables you should use to follow the trajectory, obviously. So in that case, we will use those variables and we make sort of a a classical um, uh, PCI model uh, with control limits to tell, uh, okay, are we controlling the process uh, as we as we hope? So, like for fermentation, it would be like the optical density, maybe the um, <coughs> then the uh, sort of the amount of CO2 uh, or um, like um, or the concentration or something. And, uh, that you produce, and those are the variables you should use uh, for uh, for the batch model. And of course, also one assumption is that we have more than one variable. But the good thing is that although maybe we have only only two, we can still model the data in a multiverse space, and that enables us, nevertheless, to estimate what we call is the relative time, which I will come back to shortly. So in um, in that phase, then we create a model on what is called the golden batches, where the so the quality is inside spec, and then we store that model, and we can then use it 
either offline, just taking sort of new batch data and in our software in Scrumly, you say, well, task project, uh, and then you can see um, how sort of that batch then changes over time, and if that matches um, the existing batches. Or also, you can use it online, uh, and I will briefly describe sort of a full functional uh, setup uh, later. So then in the online monitoring, we follow the batch over time. Uh, but we do it also in, in relative time, as I'll show. Uh, we can detect if things are out of spec. And also, some of you might be familiar with some specific plots so that we can automatically show like which variables have changed compared to what we expect for this point of time. And uh, then if we feed those uh, results back into your control feedback system, you can have a, a closed loop situation. So one of the challenges is that if we take here some uh, real data for uh, uh, one variable, um, it looks like this for three batches. And um, here, um, sort of many methods, um, they assume that we have the same number of, um, of time points and also that the starting point is the same. So in this case, the starting point is more or less the same, like from a chemical point of view, but you see the number of, of, uh, of sort of samples for each batch is very different. So it seems that well, so here is nothing we can do. Um, but I will come back to this later. And also, you could have different uh, stages, like in, uh, in fermentation, uh, different phases like phase, growth phase, stationary phase. And also here is shown for um, some uh, <coughs> some data, three variables, because ethanol of the density, and it seems that the batches are quite different, uh, those two batches. Also, it's not that we always need to build like a batch model where we have dynamic sort of critical uh, limits uh, from start to end. Uh, sometimes we could be happy just making what we call an endpoint model. So we take sort of the, uh, the endpoints, some uh, 10, 15 observations for each of the good batches, and we say, okay, make a model here and use this as sort of our uh, uh, sort of the target. And then we can project um, a new batch onto that model. And of course, we will at first um, be quite uh, outside of, of that um, uh, endpoint. But then uh, over time, we can see that we enter that space and say, now that's, that's fine. Now we stop the process. We have reached the end point. And also, by knowing the chemistry a little bit, we can use our background knowledge and we can see different phases maybe in, in a drying process. So back to the problem of unique uh, and equal batches. So, like, so, so the two of those. Um, a method is that sort of, well, we would like to have the same number of time points. We like the same starting point. Uh, it should evolve similarly, and we reach the end point. Uh, but if that's not the case, you can also try like dynamic time warping, so you can make those three curves that just so like uh, the same with interpolation or warping. That's not from a mathematical side a problem at all. The question is, how does that really influence sort of the chemistry? involved or the, or the biology. So if you unfold the other way, uh, like we do, then uh, you can make a first model without having uh, the same number of points. But to estimate limits, you need to have, uh, ha have the same number of data points for the batches. And then this is where we think that our approach uh, solves this in, in a very simple way. So. One could try to normalize the batches to length one, uh, or we can use a maturity index so that, well, you just make a number from one to the number of points for each batch and say this is our response and we make a regression model. And this might work if things are uh, nice and linear. 
And also, it could be that the things move in different phases. And so we can also have different models. But here, it is also then uh, a case um, where we have uh, just time as the x-axis, and we have one specific variable. And we see that there is no way we can make like one model, and even more models uh, will not represent what's going on in a chemical context. So, to summarize, uh, we're kind of also not always not all the starting point, like bacteria, uh, they are not sort of behaving in the same way uh, when you want to do a fermentation. And also, it's often not uh, linear. And also, the, the length of the batch is like, could be chemical reaction can last 16 hours or 24 hours. And that's uh, not so uncommon. Um, and our method then uh, estimates this trajectory and the sort of confidence intervals in relative time. So it means it's independent actually of the time as such. Um, and also uh, it's independent of the sampling rate. So we say, well, well, one batch is measured every five minutes, and then for some reason you change equipment, and then it would be every 10 minutes the next day. But in other, other case, that doesn't really matter. And also, uh, something that is quite new, uh, we can then also go back from the multivariate model, and we can display uh, the individual variables in relative time. So, very brief description of what we're doing. We make a PCA analysis and validate the model across batch because that's the important validation level. We shouldn't do random in that case. And then we see a plot here on the upper left of so-called golden batches. We also see that uh, especially like the green batch is behaving in a very non-linear way. Actually, the reaction sort of uh, goes a bit back there before it starts again. And we have seen for all the sort of real data sets we have analyzed with this approach, we have never seen that things are linear. So then uh, we can estimate uh, the overall trajectory and also uh, the uh, dynamic confidence uh, limits uh, from that first PCI model. And uh, this is done then sort of more or less in an automatic fashion, so only three, four inputs are needed from the user. So there's a lot of things going on, on here done in our solution under the hood. So the end result is then um, the trajectory with limits. Um, and you can choose between like typically two or three standard deviations in the in the visualization just by using a drop down list. So coming back to how can we now plot the individual process variables? Uh, and the raw data will look like this. This is just from the sample number. And so it looks like they're quite uh, different. This is for uh, pressure, one variable I will uh, come back to later. And then in relative time, we see that the batches are quite similar, which also is what we see in the two-dimensional scores. So, so just the line plot either of a, um, a score vector or in the variable um, for the time point is it, not a good indication of how far have you really come um, in in the process. So we know that we can always um, sort of use time warping and adjust uh, the historical batches to the same length, um, but that doesn't really help um, for uh, new batches because you don't know the length, obviously. So uh, that's where our approach has particular advantage, as we see it, because, as I mentioned, it's independent of sampling rate. And also, we show relative time, and also nonlinearity is not really affecting how we visualize uh, the progress. So we monitor the batch in, in the score space, and then we can detect the out of spec situation um, and we know that with the multivariate methods, we can discriminate between two types of outliers. One is 
that it's too much or too little of um, what we um, we expect, but it's still sort of the same substance. That's the trajectory model the distance. The distance to the model is then when there is something new, like you make a model for uh, uh, for three types of raw materials, and suddenly there is a new type which I haven't seen before, then that will be detected as being something else. Then also um, there is something named the contribution plot, which sort of chops up the, the total predictable distance in the individual contribution for the variable. And you can also show them relative to the trajectory, not relative to the, the center of the model, because that's not the, the right uh, way to convey uh, what's going on. And then, as I said, we might feed our results back to a control system. So here we have one example where we have projected a new batch onto that existing model. And we see that for periods of time, it will be outside. So we can show it in two dimensions, or we can also sort of show the distance um, over the relative time as a line plot, similar to a normal PCI model where you have sort of the, the hoteling statistics. Either you can show as an ellipse or you can show as one line which actually is a summary, a summary then of, of all the dimensions used in the model. But here is so that this, this limit is then changing over the relative time. And we can also then uh, look at the individual points and we can, can see uh, why are we uh, outside? And we see that in this case that uh, the values for two of the three variables uh, are different from what we uh, expect. And then if we go back to also the loading plot, we can see if they are too high or too low. And uh, again, it's important to uh, mention that this is now in relative to that time point in a relative time from from start to end. So one case here, a chemical reaction, we have three historical batches, we have only three variables, and they actually predicted here with the model based on microscopic data, but that doesn't really matter. And we will think, well, if you can predict, why do you need the batch model? But still it's so that we need to know when to stop, because if you have a lot of, uh, a lot of byproducts, uh, which will then sort of come at the end of the, the reaction, which you don't want, then you should still um, stop at the right time, and then so the chemistry will be also expressed in, in the spectroscopic data, of course. So here we have three batches for making a model and projecting all new batch. So here again we have uh, showing that one variable, just reactant, as a line plot. And uh, just um, consecutive, or we do the folded plot. Actually, it's the same I showed earlier. So then it looks like this. And they say, oh, well, how can I model this uh, uh, and make sort of a, a model that tells me what's going on? So if you look at the correlation loading, of course, not so exciting with three variables, but still it gives us an idea what's going on here. And I will show the loading and the score plots shortly after this. Some of you might not be familiar with the, uh, the term correlation loading, but loading should be well known for everyone working with, with PCA or some point of time. So we see that the correlation loadings are very informative because the typical question from users when they look at loading costs is, well, what is the sort of the cutoff to say that the variable is important or not? And then sadly, we cannot really say because the square sum of the loadings for individual variables will always be one in, in PCA, so that's how most people do it. But the correlation loadings, they will tell also directly the explained variance. So the outer circle means 100% explained variance and the inner is 50%. So it means we see explained variance directly and also we can, we can see uh, uh, how the variables are correlated independent also of the scaling action. And we use this for many tricks, like to introduce dummy variables for qualitative information, like uh, 
uh, raw material or machine or day or whatever. So this is uh, now the map of variables. And here we see the score plot uh, to the left. So we see that we move from the upper uh, left here, and then we go through the intermediate, and then we end up with the product. So it all makes sense. But again, if you look at this as a line plot uh, in one dimension, we don't get the correct information about the chemistry because it happens so that the red batch has uh, fewer um, data points than uh, the others because that reaction just sort of chemically went, went faster than, than the others. So then we can estimate the trajectory and the limit. And now we are ready to um, project a, a new batch onto this model. Just to go back to plot also the score plot from the, the second physical component. Again, sample number, it looks like they are very different, but in relative time, it looks like this with limit. And also, as I mentioned, we can now display the individual variables in relative time. So instead of showing folded, we can also show them in relative time. And now we see that uh, the batches are similar in uh, sort of a chemical context. Then we have the trajectory model distance. That's then also changing over time, obviously. Um, and this is the way we can convey, for example, to uh, to operators or people that don't know anything about uh, sort of the virtual right or the search, but we say, okay, if you are uh, inside this uh, limit, uh, you are fine. Then we have the residuals, that's the distance to the model if there is something new, and in this case, there is not, so we have no outliers now in for the, uh, uh, the historical batches anyway. Again, this is now a dynamic limit based on the F residuals. And also we can show um, the Q residual, which also has been explained in sort of one of the first papers by Gregors and others. Uh, in many cases, if you use one or the other, it doesn't really matter. We find sort of the F residuals a bit simpler from a statistical point of view. So now we can project a new batch onto this model. And we see that it, it starts more or less in the same state, the upper left, and then it progresses. But we also see that at the end, uh, it suddenly sort of uh, goes out, out of the bounds and uh, goes back. It means that it goes back to actually having more of the intermediate, because that's sort of uh, direction to the, to the left. So how can we display this in um, one-dimensional plot? Well, if you just plot the sampling number, uh, we see that uh, we come to like number 55, and then actually the uh, uh, the process is sort of finished. So there is no progress afterwards. Uh, but if we do it in relative time, it's much easier to see that, well, we reached 100% sort of conversion and nothing is happening. But then if you look at the trajectory model distance, we see that now after reaching 100%, uh, we're going out of bounds here. So now there is something about the relationship between the, um, the and the uh, intermediate the product that is, is not right. So how can we use this in, uh, in real life? Well, we make the model and um, we have applications, typically fermentation, chemical reactions, drying, mixing, um, and uh, then with our software, the Scamble X process code, uh, we can Sort of upload the different models. We will connect to um, a data source and we can do it with 
specific uh, sensor format, or it could be an OPC, or it could be a link to a database of any sort, so it's very flexible. Um, and then we take the new data in real time, and we uh, display it um, together with the trajectory and the control limit. So our approach uh, well, was the relative time, and also that's the case for the new batches, and not projected just a sample number, which in most cases doesn't give the right information. And also this, this applies to the individual process variables, which I think it's quite a, uh, a new aspect. And we don't need to sort of pre-process the data by forcing them to come in length or chop off of some of the, the samples just to make them so similar or to work, work them uh, to look uh, like they're the same. And also, we can, of course, make a model for the maturity index directly from the scores, but it's not needed because uh, the little time is given anyway directly. And we can use the one-dimensional representation uh, with the intervals uh, to visualize um, for the operators and people interested mostly in if uh, things are under control. And then the experienced user has access to them the scores, distance, the model, the residual contribution. So if you want to know more, there is a webinar in two weeks' time by our colleague um, Heather Brook. Um, and also there is a demo video available on uh, YouTube. And also if you want to know more, uh, you can set up sort of a, a time for us to go more into detail, if you like, and also here is a link to an article describing uh, our approach. So thank you so much for your attention. Now we open up for questions. Yeah, thank you so much, Frank. I think this was um, a really good uh, first kind of overview. As you can imagine, uh, there is a lot more depth to it, hence uh, we're pointing you to some additional materials. What I added to um, uh, the webinar itself here, there are a couple of handouts. It's the article uh, that Frank also referred to, and also um, a data sheet outlining the features and the technical details about the batch modeling solution. So just uh, um, to uh, be clear, there's a lot more depth to this. And uh, for the next webinar that we're planning on the 15th of September, we're going to have. Um, we're going to have uh, talk even more about the use cases. So um, we have received a number of questions. Let's see if we can expand this one. Um, a very small module. Okay, just a minute. We'll we'll just um, try to find the right questions. Let me just. For some reason, it's very hard for us to see the questions. <laughs> I don't know why that's done. Let's see if we can see any questions here. Okay. I don't know. Question here. Can you see it? Yes. Okay, so how can we know if a batch is running if it's if it's not finished? Uh, well, that's where the uh, relative time comes into play. So that's what we show directly. And if we have that the batch model, so going from zero to hundred percent relative, um, we can f monitor that directly. And also say that if you stop the process for some time, then our approach will just sort of stop and say, well, nothing is happening, although, of course, the, the time uh, will move as uh, such. Okay. So the second question we have here is around the end point. Yes, it's a question about the 
complexity of the model. Um, so uh, the approach that we have is implemented. So uh, you can use up, uh, up, up to three uh, physical components. Um, and then we can still visualize it um, as a, as a one, one line plot. Uh, um, also in the development phase also we looked at how can we do it for <laughs> four and five and more. Uh, but then also we see that for most cases, if you don't sort of see the changes over time in the first uh, like uh, first two components, then maybe those variables are not telling you what's going on. So we can most cases we uh, we can deal with like with, with of the three components. We we in most cases uh, we see the the trajectory, and typically for spectral data, uh, like the first two components may be baseline effect or something then remove them with uh, some uh, pre-processing methods and then you see the trajectory after that. So the can the time estimate the completion be derived from the trajectory? Yes, that comes uh, directly uh, in the projection onto the uh, trajectory and the relative time. Okay, so we have, we have um, a few more questions here coming in. So please, if you have any more questions, you, you feel free to ask them. So there's one question, how do we really get from the real time to the relative time scale? Uh, and that's where we then, um, um, one of sort of the, the things going out and, uh, under the hood. So then in the two-dimensional or three-dimensional score space, uh, we sort of, we chop up that, uh, that space in, in different um, sort of compartments. Uh, and then we find sort of the, the start and the end point, and then and they, that enables us to, to estimate the relative time independent of how many um, sample sort of time points we have in different parts uh, of, of the trajectory. Right, so we have more questions um, coming in here. And uh, yes, yeah, so about the time warping, um, of, does it prevent or the name minutes and the chemical kinetic information. Mm, yeah, that's one of uh, the key points because we can always make um, some sort of trajectories based on um, sample number, uh, like with the uh, interpolation or time warping, but then it's the question, what happens then to the relative time? Because then if you go back and look in the two-dimensional score space, it would be then, uh, uh, somewhat distorted, so I don't really think that's a good idea. You might do it for historical data, uh, but in the monitoring phase, there are no way to to really to, to warp that, those new information, those new sounds. So it means that you you need to have different approaches uh, when it comes to offline and online if scenarios. If you with time warping, I cannot see how you can really handle that in an online situation. Hmm. And also about the data streams. Yes, and in our uh, software process books, we can have different data streams and we can feed like one data source into another. So um, it's a possibility. Yeah, so that's something that, that I know uh, you typically get a lot of questions on, Frank, when it comes to data sources and connectors. Um, is, is that anything in particular you need to think about for batch modeling? Not really. The process tools can handle different data sources uh, for any type of model, if it's prediction or if it could be a moving, moving block model to find an endpoint of mixing operations. Um, and also, I mentioned some possible applications, but we haven't sort of explored <laughs> every possible application yet, and also for like in, in medical research, when you're following patients' recovery over time, our approach will then show sort of recovery in relative time, not sort of the day that uh, patients came came to the lab for doing metabolomic uh, studies, for example. And also to monitor uh, machinery for wear and tear when, when it's the right time to do maintenance. And this is also complex, uh, this approach could be quite useful. Yeah, and I know, I know, Frank, you keep uh, telling me when you meet customers, you get new ideas on applications every time. Yeah. So, so why do you think that is? Well, 
think of that same also for other methods like we have in Scrum, like for example the method called the, the, the LCLS, which can be used to model three data tables, where one table is described by two others. At first we thought, well, this is just for uh, like marketing and product development, but it's also relevant for spectroscopy, where you have a band assignment table at the third table, or it could be like environmental uh, research, uh, where you have like a species for different habitats, and the habitats have characteristics and the species. So as for other methods also, we get ideas when you meet people and say, well, I've seen something similar before, let's, let's try this, and you combine all your experience and say, well, maybe this is the solution. Yeah, I find this really interesting. And um, another question we get uh, from customers is obviously, I mean, how hard is it to implement this in, in a, an existing process of some kind? Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, once you have uh, the batch model and it's connected uh, then with the data source, then set up a configuration and process but it's, it's fairly easy. And then it's plug and play. And um, maybe you say you want to develop uh, sort of a new process and you start just by collecting the data. You make your first model, make a couple of batches, and then you start, uh, start to monitor. Maybe not at first with a batch model, just monitor with a PCA model so qualitatively to see if uh, the project uh, sort of um, it's projected in the same way when it comes to the development over time. So depending on sort of what phase you are actually in, in a project, it could be going from the very sort of the, the simple uh, um, projection or the endpoint model, and then finally you end up with the, the batch model with the sort of critical limits that you use for uh, the production phase. Right. Thank you so much. I think this um, this will um, this concludes. We've been through most of the questions we've gotten, and I really hope that this has given you um, a good insight into this new uh, innovative approach to batch modeling that we put on the market. Just um, the product was released uh, this summer, and with European time zone, I should say, <laughs> and. Um, as I mentioned, there are a couple of um, handouts in the webinar itself. We will we'll also share the recording afterwards. And obviously, if you do wish to have a, a demo or similar, uh, you feel free to contact us and let us know on how we can help you to uh, uh, move forward. So with that, um, I'd like to conclude the session. Thank you so much, Frank, for a, a good presentation again. And um, everyone have a great evening or similar. Yeah, thank you so much for attending, and I guess uh, the most will stay in touch.